I see the chat room filling up. We'll wait just a minute or so before we get started. People still coming in. We'll wait about 30 more seconds or so, and then we'll get started. Joking. Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone, uh, depending on where you might be. I am Rob Burgess, and I head up business development for Sino Biological. And it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the next installment in our Sino Biological's Lock and Key Immunodetection webinar series. We have a wonderful speaker today which I, the person I will introduce here in just a minute. Before I do that, though, I just want to suggest one housekeeping issue, and that is that um, you type in number one, say hello into the chat box and tell us where you're from. We always like to know what parts of the world people are calling in from. And then number two, if you have a question for our speaker, go ahead and type it into the chat box and we'll withhold all questions until the end of the seminar, and then I will verbally scroll through the chat box and get to each question as best as I can. Uh, and so with that, now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you all to our guest speaker for today. It is Dr. Neil Goldstein. Dr. Neil Goldstein is currently the Chief Scientific Officer at Skunk Works Bio Incorporated. Dr. Goldstein's career encompasses 40 plus years of scientific research and senior management positions which span both academia and the pharmaceutical industry. He brings a broad working knowledge of drug discovery, which has contributed to the development of many preclinical drug leads, one of which uh, was the early regulatory approval of Herbitox. He is also a co-inventor on more than 15 issued patents and has authored more than 70 plus peer reviewed publications in both journals and books. In his current role as a CSO at Skunk Works, he has developed a novel small protein and single domain antibody libraries, which have been used to identify and generate preclinical drug leads in the therapeutic areas of oncology, immuno-oncology, and infectious disease. His other previous roles include Chief Operating Officer of Helio Genetics, President and Chief Scientific Officer of Antira, Vice President of Research at GenQuest and Director of Immunology at MClone Systems. Dr. Goldstein received his BS from CCNY and his doctorate from Waxman Institute of Microbiology at Rutgers University. And then finally, he completed his postdoctoral work at the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia. And um, as I stated, has worked in both pharma and biotech. And so Dr. Goldstein, it's an honor and pleasure to have you today. I will stop sharing my screen so you can share yours and start your lecture. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, share screen. Can you see it? Yeah, we got your first slide. Go All ahead. right. All right, let me get this up here. Let, let me first of all, let me let me thank the uh, Rob and Priscilla and the people of Sino for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, the work we're doing at Skunk Works Bio. So let me get what, what Skunk Works is out of the way first. Now, Skunk Works is actually a business term, which is used to describe an offsite away from a main uh, facility where innovative and secretive work is done. It was originally coined by uh, Lockheed Martin during World War II, where they worked on various uh, novel airplanes, like the uh, Lightning on the left. The lower left is the P-38 Lightning. Uh, the middle one is the first jet plane called the F-80, 
And the one on the right is the SR-71, which is a, uh, a spy plane used during the Cold War. In fact, if you're in the New York area and visit the Intrepid Museum, they have uh, an example on the flight deck. So once again, a, a Skunk Works is an offsite secret of work. And we're lucky because we're in New Jersey and our headquarters is in North Carolina. So I have 700 miles of, uh, between me and the administration. So let me give you a quick idea of, of what we are, what we've done, and, and, and uh, what we, you know, uh, who we are. Uh, we were founded in 2020. Our labs at the, at the New Jersey Bioscience Center uh, near Rutgers University in New Brunswick. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of a, of a publicly traded company called Scorpius Holdings, and they've invested about $5 million to date. We have several pending patents on our research programs, and we were recently awarded an STTR from NIH to develop novel drug conjugates for treating pediatric neural tumors, specifically ATRT, at Weill Cornell Medical School. Now, we have a, an interesting way of approaching drug discovery. Our goal, obviously, is to make it more efficient and less expensive. So obviously, there's ways of doing this. First of all, starting with target, identifying the drug that binds to the target. You can look at a disease and try to identify those targets inherently expressed in that disease. We have what we call an agnostic approach in which we look at both diseases and targets with the goal of decreasing the timeline so we can get into an IND, IND as quickly as possible. The goal here also is to lower the expenses because as a small biotech, we do have restraints on what we're able to spend. Now, another tagline we use is that smaller is better. I've been working on monoclonal antibodies since Cole and Milstein published in 1975. And antibodies are great, great products, but they are big, they're difficult to make, they're expensive to make. So our goal is to make something smaller. And we've decided to look at single domain antibodies fully human single domain antibodies, which I'll describe in a couple of minutes. In addition to that, people have also used proteins as potential therapeutics. And our goal is to make them smaller as well. So we actually look at pro, uh, small proteins in the range of 2,000 to 8,000 Daltons. Now, what are the advantages, for example, of using small proteins? Well, at the 20 plus amino acid range, you start getting secondary structure alpha helices, beta pleated sheets, et cetera. Because our libraries are high, have high diversity, basically greater than 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 independent clones, you can also find tertiary structure in which they form conformations due to, let's say, disulfide bondings. So the number of potential disulfide bonds increase, giving us the tertiary structure. In addition, our libraries are totally random, which gives increased opportunities for identifying those amino acid sequences, which were important in protein, protein interactions and protein non-protein interactions. And in fact, our tagline is biology makes a decision about what's important. Whatever binds is important. And obviously what we're looking for beyond binding is biological activity. I won't go into phage display. It's been around for a while. We're not reinventing the wheel here. We use M13 phage. We insert our small proteins or single domain antibodies into gene three. The reason for gene, using gene three for those not uh, fluent in um, phage display of technology is because there's three to five copies per phage. So it's almost monoclonal. So what do we do? What do we, what do, how have we designed our drug discovery paradigm? We have two sets of libraries. Our synthetic libraries are 20 or 40 amino acids. They're totally randomized, and we have diversity of greater than 10 to the 11 independent clones. Obviously, we haven't sequenced 10 to the 11 clones. It's based statistically on the number of clones we have uh, sequenced and the fact that we haven't found any repeats when we're looking uh, during the sequencing. The second set of libraries are single domain libraries. They're fully human in the sense that the framework are germline human genes. However, each of the CDRs, one, two, and three, are fully randomized, which allows us to identify sequences outside the normal human repertoire. So everything we find is going to be specific to target and not biased in favor of those um, sequences within antibodies that you might find if you pool multiple uh, individuals to, ident to generate a fully human, uh, fully human library. And once again, a high diversity. 
So we have randomized binding sequences in both our synthetic libraries and our single domain libraries. Now we want to make these better. And the way we do that is by two approaches. One is something called directed engineering, which allows to us to increase diversity. And I'll explain it in the next slide. And the second way is a computational approach called selective evolution. Now what directed engineering allows us to do is twofold. Number one, because it's very expensive and I've, I've used um, uh, Sino to make uh, some of these single domain antibodies and they're not inexpensive. I discovered a while ago that if you take the CDR3 peptide out and put it in a biological assay, you can get an idea of biological activity of the antibody itself. So that allows us to ge quickly generate the small peptide, put it in the appropriate assay and then decide have a go, no go about which of these antibodies, these single domain antibodies are worth moving into uh, synth for, you know, further synthesis and purification. The second thing we do is take some of these target specific small proteins and actually put them into the CDR3 of the single domain antibodies. So we have two, uh, two, two things that we, we, we can do here. Number one, if you have a single domain antibody to a target, and a small protein to that target, you can actually reinvent and put in that single domain, single a small protein into the CDR3 and have a fully formed um, target specific single domain antibody. But the other thing we can do is actually null CDR1, CDR2, put in a CDR3 and have a, a chimeric antibody that we've shown will actually bind to target. In addition to that, because we have large small proteins, we can put it into the CDR3 and have what we call bovine-like uh, immunoglobulins in the sense that bovine immunoglobulins, their CDR3s can have as many as 70 amino acids. So in essence, what we're making are chimeric antibodies that look like bovine antibodies, but are fully human. So bottom line for directed engineering is that we can mix and match and identify those single domain antibodies with the best specificities, affinities, and potencies. In terms of selective evolution, what we look for are those amino acids at each position that have the best or best or, or, or optimal for binding target. What I show you here is an old, some old work I did in which I identified an agonist for the DR3 receptor. It's a TNF-related receptor involved in T cell help, T helper cells. What I show you here is that there was an antibody uh, developed by our parent company called PTX35, which was an agonist for DR3. However, it's a full antibody. My goal was to identify a single domain antibody, which did the same thing, and that's shown in white. Uh, DR3 is shown in green. TO1A, which is a natural ligand for DR3, is shown in blue. So what you see on the, on the left is where they bind. They all bind in the same positions. And what you see on, on the right are those amino acids which are involved in binding to the uh, hotspot or the receptor binding site on DR3. And you can see that they match quite well. So this is an idea of, uh, of sort of an example of selective evolution where we identify those appropriate amino acids, make those in each position, make those changes and improve affinity, potency and selectivity. We can do this very quickly. We can identify binders within two weeks, and that includes sequencing. And if I want to work weekends, I can find it a lot quicker. So what we're trying to do here, once again, is move drug discovery to the left. That is make it more efficient and more time, uh, time dependent. And basically within three, uh, four to five weeks, we can put some of these leads, which are obviously made by a vendor into biological assays, and then make go, no go decisions about further development, specifically whether we go into animals. So what do we end up with? We end up with small biologics that are target specific. These are therapeutics, potential therapeutics. So we have the small proteins I mentioned, 20 to 80 amino acids with agonist or antagonist activity. We have small single domain, fully human antibodies outside the human repertoire. These are applicable for any disease or uh, any target. And we can, we can identify those which are internalizing. Now, why those? Well. One of our biggest projects, one of our things that are our leads are these target specific drug conjugates in which we hook up no, uh, you know, known drugs and novel drugs or biological inhibitors to our small proteins and our single domain antibodies. And we can use this 
to identify those which bind to drugs that have not been used clinically, like uh, panabinostat, tasmetostat, gemcitabine, mostinostat, which are HDAC, some of these are HDAC inhibitors. And we can also look for those which bind to quote unquote undruggable targets like KRAS and NIC. I told Rob and Priscilla that oh, we use a lot of Sino products to do our work and all of these, except for the viral bacterial antigens are, uh, are recombinant proteins I bought at Sino. Now we have, a, we have a, a, a protocol called fail fast. And by that, I mean, I have all these in the freezer. Obviously I can't work on them. So fail fast means that we work on those which make the most sense for a small company to move forward towards uh, potential clinical trials. So what do we have? We have novel therapeutics with excellent product profiles. They're specific for any targeted disease indication, high affinity potency and selectivity. And if the original ones are not, we can make them by either selective evolution or direct engineering, fully human antibodies, all our things are agonists or antagonists, cell penetrating for uh, target specific delivery. They can be stabilized. And obviously from a small company, decreased uh, cost of goods and with the small proteins consistency in manufacturing uh, small proteins. Okay, so Shakespeare said what's past is prologue. So let me go into some of the old stuff that we did that sort of lays the basis for this work. In the past, we have, uh, we used similar uh, high, high diversity random libraries to look at various uh, uh, types of uh, uh, target protein-protein uh, interactions. So in this case, we pan TNF beta. We ended up with that protein on the top and the glycine proline sort of uh, linker is not a linker. It came up based on as a binder. Now, when we blasted that, put it through a blast search, it turned out that the RKEMG in red and the WSENLFQ turned out to be um, identical to the hotspot that is a ligand binding site on the cognate receptor for TNF beta, which is TNFR1. Now, TNF beta and TNFR1 have been co crystallized, and it turns out that the distance between the hotspots shown on the uh, TNFR1, that large sequence below, I think you can see it with the pointer, is actually equidistant to the distance between here and the small peptide. So the TNFR1 folds, and the distance between the two hotspots, which bind to TNF beta, are the same distance as the original peptide we found randomly. This came out of a large screen, and this was one of the peptides we found. In this uh, example, we panned mRNA, and here we found a motif uh, that was, uh, which was TX, which X being uh, any amino acid, uh, arginine, leucine, leucine. I found it, this is my uh, pan, this is a colleague's pan, came up in both. When we blasted it, we came up with a um, protein called P170, which is part of the EIF3 complex which is found in the ribosomes and is responsible for translation. So the goal here was potentially to make a therapeutic, a biological, a small molecule bi a biological that would block uh, translation of hepatitis C mRNA. This is another example I'm quite proud of because we identified a fully functional insulin mimetic that was different than insulin, smaller than insulin, and um, had better pharmacokinetic, not pharmacokinetic, but biochemical properties, very stable at high temperatures, et cetera. And we did this in collaboration with Novo Nordisk. Bottom line here is I'm not going to go through all this, this verbiage, but we identified two sites or three sites that were not competitive. And what we were able to do is by using computational approaches, identify a preferred peptide for each position in which the amino acids were optimal for protein-protein interactions, that is the binding of these small proteins to the insulin receptor. Those are shown in red, right? The blue uh, underline uh, for RP9 is actually a motif found for the site one peptides or small proteins. Site two had no motif, but we were able to identify preferred amino acids shown in red as well. And you can see that by combining them in a specific orientation, that is site two in front of site one, we came up with what's called 519, which had an affinity close to that of insulin itself, 16 picomolar, and a biological activity uh, that was equal, equal molar to insulin in terms of rat glucose uh, uptake, glucose uptake in, rat, uh, in rats, which I'll show you in the next slide. The interesting thing here was that if you reverse the sequences, put the site 
one, in front of site two, you developed a highly potent insulin antagonist, which is not found in nature. So just by manipulating these small proteins, you can find agonist, antagonist, whatever. This shows uh, several papers we published. The insulin uh, the structure of the insulin uh, binding sites are shown on the left. And on the right, you can show, we've shown that we get equal, equal molar uh, insulin, uh, glucose uptake in rats. Now, the interesting thing is that other people have used this mimetic for various reasons. The interesting, the most important one is the one on the left in which a group uh, used the mimetic to actually crystallize the insulin receptor. Now, no one had been able to crystallize the insulin receptor because it's quite labile. These people used the mimetic to do it. The other papers on the right, were, they used the mimetic for other uh, biochemical analyses of the insulin receptor. Let me quickly go through another uh, approach we call SESTA, which I still use now for cell-specific or cell surface targets. Bottom line here is that we use the libraries, we do negative selection against irrelevant cells. Let's say I'm looking for those antigens expressed only on pancreatic cells, or I'll pan normal cells, prostate cancer, breast cancer, et cetera, and I'll identify target-specific binders. The beauty of the technology is that we can identify those small proteins or antibodies which have biological activity because we set up the assay prior to this before we know what it actually is. So I can do a biological characterization, determine whether it's worthwhile pursuing, and then do target identification. This shows, I mean, there's a lot of work behind this, which I won't go into. This just shows uh, the fact that we were able to show animal data with two of our uh, small proteins made against uh, prostate cancer uh, cell lines uh, using the SESTA approach. On the left, we can see that if we look at G12 versus an irrelevant small protein, you can see that there's a highly significant decrease in, in, in inhibition of tumor growth in a xenograft giving subcutaneous injections. On the right is just a, a more complete experiment looking at a whole bunch of different uh, controls. And once again, we get a significant effect of um, G12 and C7 uh, in one case, in both cases at 12.5 milligrams per kilogram, and in the case of G12 at 2.5 milligrams per kilogram. So now we have some more protein. This is only about 25 amino acids, which actually have a very significant biological effect in vivo. So how do we identify the uh, target? Well, we used a pull-down assay in order to pull out potential uh, uh, binders to the target. So if you look on the left, we biotinylated the G12 hooked it to strep avid in beads, ran a lysate through it, and then identified five bands, which we sent out to a vendor who did uh, N-terminal sequencing by NMR. We then used a mammalian two hybrid system, in which our bait was a small protein and the prey was a cDNA with a luciferase readout with various controls and, 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 and related targets. So if you look at the um, mammalian two hybrid uh, uh, graph on, on the right, Number three is the putative target that was identified from the um, pull-down assay. The controls in front, no, 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 uh, no binding. And then four and five are two related proteins. This is a, a family of, uh, of, 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 of proteins and the uh, non-specific proteins did not bind. So bottom line here is that we identified a putative target. Now, once again, how do we fit it into a general uh, therapeutic scheme? Well, it turns out if you look at uh, the PCR on the right, the cell line, DU145, which is prostate cancer, expresses the, the uh, putative target, the irrelevant, an irrelevant target, and the putative receptor. So we can able to make a decision that this is a possible mechanism of action. That is, that G12 blocks the binding of target to receptor, and this receptor-target interaction is involved in breast cancer, prostate cancer as we expected, and many other cancers. So we basically identify an unknown target as druggable. And this has the potential to be moved forward as a lead candidate as well. All right, so let me quickly move in the uh, 15 to 20 minutes I have left to our present programs. Our major program, one of our major programs now is developing drug conjugates. And our lead program, once again, goes back to uh, the work we did on the insulin receptor, it followed that we more, might want to find something 
binding and antagonizing the IGF-1R receptor because IGF-1R and insulin receptor are related. We identified 429, had excellent uh, affinity of 630 picomolar. It blocked many of the uh, in vitro uh, attributes of IGF binding to IGF receptor. We can block it, we showed phosphorylation, it uh, inhibited proliferation, it was specific, more specific for IGF-1R versus IR, but it also inhibited IGF-1R IR hybrid receptors, which are found in cancer cells. So once again, I'll show you the in vitro, the in vivo work on the next slide. It's an indication it's multiple cancers in which uh, IGF-1R is overexpressed. I wanna draw your attention to the green a line on the bottom, we were able to show by giving uh, four injections per week for three weeks of the peptide alone that we could significantly inhibit tumor growth. And that's shown on the right. You can see that the tumors look like at uh, 12 mg per kg. And you, if you look at the tumor weights at the end, there was a significant inhibition of tumor weights versus the controls and uh, the irrelevant uh, uh, small protein. So what did we decide to do? We decided to take 429, which is against a, a, a tumor-associated antigen, and make it into a drug conjugate. So on the left of the screen, circling around, is shows uh, IGF. It shows putatively where um, the 429 binds, which is shown in green, and where IGF binds. So IGF uh, binds, uh, well, okay. So 429 binds next to, not within the uh, binding site, but close to, so it could be an allosteric effect. We also had to show that it internalized, which is shown in the middle panel. This shows internalization of, of labeled 429 into uh, specific cancer cells. And what we did was, was, was make a conjugates initially with orostatin. Now, orostatin is a drug of choice for many drug conjugates, antibody drug conjugates. We decided this would be a good one to start. We were able to show that we could have a, a fairly substantial, a good uh, tumor inhibitory effect with an IC50 of uh, 12 nanomol, which is quite good. And we can also show that we, that took about five days to show an effect. But within 24 hours, if you look at the left panel, you can show, show an inhibition of microtubules with uh, 429 overexpressing or statin. It's not complete because at five days, there are no cells to look at. So we did the 24. And you can see in the, in, in the middle and the, and the bottom panel, a uh, comparison of 429 with orostatin, orostatin itself at 100 nanomolar, which is well above the IC50, you can start seeing disruption of uh, tubulin uh, within these cells. Now, the critical issue was, would it, it work in animal models and would it work through a systemic approach? And the answer is, yeah, it did. If you look at the left, this shows uh, uh, an animal experiment we did. And if you look at the top right-hand panel in blue, it shows that with established tumors giving uh, four injections IV, right? We were able to basically abrogate the growth of an established tumor. This is a gastric, human gastric tumor cell line, right? We compared it to a scrambled um, a version of 429 with orostatin, which had no effect. We compared it to an ADC, an antibody drug conjugate made by Merck against the IGF receptor, expressing uh, or also linked to or, or statin. And you can see it was variable. Some, some of the animals showed an effect, some didn't. And then on the right, uh, lower right, you can see that the 429 peptide by itself, as I showed previously, has a biological effect. And this is shown more dramatically on the right where we took the tumors at the end, weighed them. And you can see that obviously the 429 with the orostatin uh, tumors, there were no growth. The tumors were basically non-existent. But also the, uh, the ADC, as you'd expect, there was a significant inhibition of growth, but the peptide alone also inhibited this, which shows that we're able to identify small proteins that will have a biological effect against target in target-specific uh, manner. So let me take this one step further. We've decided that we also wanted to use this to deliver uh, biologics to inhibit MYC. Now, for those of you who are initiated, MYC is dysregulated and an etiologic factor in 70% in, in of human cancers. And what it does is it works uh, transcriptionally to turn on genes that are involved in proliferation. It's considered an undruggable target. Now, 
All right. What was my okay? Okay. Now Mick actually works by binding to a protein called Max, and I'll show you that in a couple of slides that uh, we're able to block that as well. So what we first did was identified an inhibitor of Mick. I won't tell you what that is because it's proprietary, but we set up a, um, uh, uh, a conjugate which included 429, which inhibits antagonizes IGF receptor, a linker, a nuclear localization signal, and the inhibitor itself. Now, if you look at the lower left, the inhibitor is shown in red, and you can see that alpha helix. Now, it turns out that MYC in the inhibitor has been co-crystallized, and the region that binds to MYC is what we recapitulated in the inhibitor portion here, forms an alpha helix. So in our model of the conjugate, it retains that alpha helix. The panel on the right shows that we can, it will internalize and will actually go to the nucleus. You can see that uh, the blue is the nucleus. You can see the green uh, becomes sort of uh, light blue. That shows internalization with the nucleus. Now, I'm going to show you some vitro data because we're currently doing the animal models for this. On the right shows a comparison of 429 with orostatin, which is in sort of the, uh, the bronze line. The ADC is in green. But you can see that the 429 with the mimic and orostatin is almost as good as um, orostatin itself. And that's also shown in the panel on the right, which is a viability stain called calcin. And what you can say is that we, we've improved the conjugate, um, the conjugate's um, a potency many fold, many logs, just by including that MIC inhibitor. Okay, so those the, that's currently in animal models. Our second MIC approach was to actually identify a small protein that bound to MIC itself. And what we did is make a dimer. So this is a dimer of 220 amino acid um, proteins that bind to MIC. They're the same. So it's, it's a homo dimer. And the linker is just a glycine serine dimer with a cysteine in the middle. And the real reason we put the cysteine in the middle is because in order to link a drug to it, you have to use a cysteine. That's how the link it binds. On the right shows that this will internalize. Now, this is really pretty cool. We modeled the binding of MIC to MAX. MAX is the downstream translational binder to, MAC, to MIC and is involved in transcription of these genes which induce cancer. If you look in the middle panel, 2626 and dimer will actually block the binding site uh, where, MIC, where, where MAX binds to MIC. So this gives us a good indication that we're seeing a biological response, or we should. And in fact, we do. We can show that we block cell viability with this dimer by itself. But more interestingly, on the right panel, you can see that if you do a few RT-PCR and look at MIC, black means it's not expressed. So we can actually, with the control, which is this JQ1, which is, uh, which is an inhibitor of MIC, you can block it, that's in black. But if you look at, uh, or we call in that case, I call it SKWX1001, it's just a, 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 a business term. The dimer will actually block the expression of, of MIC. So that explain, that really goes a long way to showing that we have a mechanism of action that will affect an undruggable target. And in fact, if you look at in vitro, uh, we can show that we actually block um, with this, uh, with this uh, drug, which I won't go into because it's also a, uh, a drug that's not being used routinely. We've made these bispecifics in which we've made either the dimer with the drug and we can block it. And we've made 429, the IGF inhibitor with the drug and you're getting um, a biological effect in IC50 close to that of the drug itself. Now, why is this important? Well, ADCs, are the happening area right now. And in fact, you can see from Guggenheim Securities, they project sales of 28 billion by 2030. I've seen it as high as 40 billion. So what can we do? We can make drug conjugates to clinically commercially validated targets. We can identify novel targets. We can identify conjugates with novel mechanisms of action. And we can make new drug conjugates with drugs and bispecific payloads. And in fact, what are our competitive advantages? Well. Cheaper to make. I mean, it's a 25 year and it's going to be a lot. I can make a gram of the material for two grand. So we're talking very, very cheap compared to fermentation, purification for antibodies. 
Greater tumor penetration makes sense because it's smaller, fewer off-target effects, because what people have shown, because we have a shorter half-life, it, 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 you get accretion within the tumor very quickly. With an antibody, it's going to circulate 7, 8, 10, 21 days. You get off-target effects because the linker dissociates. And some of these drugs are very, very toxic. These are patentable, and they're fully human. So that's our drug approach. We have animal models ongoing, and this, these, one of these will be our lead, and we should make a decision by that by the end of the year. So let me talk about uh, the single, a single domain antibody we made to a target called TIM4. Uh, I won't go into all this verbiage, but just say, let's just understand that TIM4 is important. What it does is it reduces antigen presentation. So people have shown that if you block TIM4, you can increase um, biological effects in combination with PD-1 inhibitors because you increase antigen presentation so T cells are more active. We first identified uh, various TIM4 uh, biologics. And the two I want to bring your attention to are in blue in the uh, sort of the middle, the phagocytosis assay. 3E was a 20 more peptide we made that blocked TIM4 uh, phagocytosis. And 2B, which is the last one, it's in blue. You can see the, two, the error bars on top. Um, came out of an antibody we made to TIM4. All right. So we took out the peptide by directive engineering, made it, tried it in the assay, it had biological effect. But it appeared that 3E was better. So what we did was, was made by directed engineering this chimeric antibody. With CDR1 and CDR2 came from the antibody that was made specifically against TIM4 and taken out 2B, which was, we call 2B, which was the CDR3 peptide, and we inserted the 3E peptide. Forgive, forgive the nomenclature, it's just... Uh, it's just in-house nomenclature. So we made a chimeric antibody by directed engineering. And in fact, what we found was, number one, that it had a great, the structure looked good. The CDR3 is shown in green and it's exposed as you'd expect and available for binding to target. And then if you look on the right, it, the, uh, the, um, the antibody bound to both, both bound to, uh, to TIM4, but not to TIM3, which is another, related ones, we got high specificity. In addition, it bound not only to mouse TIM3, but to human TIM3, which is important. Well, I won't go into this. It, it worked in the various assays, but it's important because you have to do this in a syngenetic model because you're looking at T cells. So here we looked at mouse colorectal cancer with our colleagues at the University of Miami. And we showed that in combination with the PD-1 inhibitor, three injections given IP of our single domain antibody with an FC, actually showed significant effects in terms of blocking the growth of these tumors, right? So you look at the green squares on the bottom. This was significant. It was actually better than PD-1 alone and better than a Merck reference antibody to TIM-4. To TIM so our single domain antibody with an FC, it's 40,000 molecular weight, still one, -third the si one quarter the size of a full antibody, was better than and only three injections what you're able to show the biological effect. You can also show survival, which is shown on, by the green line on top, the animal survived, whereas the various controls, including the reference antibody, PD-1 inhibitors did not work. So once again, we have uh, uh, showing that our approach, we can develop therapeutic uh, molecules that will work either as small proteins or single domain antibodies. And this is also one of our potential group compounds. So what are our indications for TIM4? Well, it turns out melanoma, advanced melanoma is because first of all, there are no uh, treatments for advanced melanoma, stage four, stage three, stage four. And people have shown that, uh, that melanoma is susceptible to this, this, uh, this uh, approach to, to blocking TIM4 using a PD-1 inhibitor. We've also shown that if you look at this array that we used, in fact, we used a TIM4 antibody with a mouse FC to do this. So it can also be used as a, um, as a uh, I forgot the word I'm looking for, as a diagnostic as well, just by changing the FC, that it binds to malignant melanoma, but not to adjacent normal. So once again, we've put in grants for this, we're doing that, we've done animal studies and we expect to, this could be potentially one of our lead compounds. Uh, and several companies may be interested in this because both their programs have sort of reached a dead end because their antibodies only bind to mouse, ours don't bind to both mouse and human. So let me summarize this very quickly, or oh, I'm right in time. 
Uh, we have a flexible and integrated approach for, for drug discovery. It's efficient. I can do this within two weeks to get binders, another couple of weeks to make it by our vendor, biological assay, go, no, go. It's integrated. So we can look at both uh, both uh, small proteins and single domain antibodies. We can mix and match, increase diversity just by, 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 by moving things in and out uh, using recombinant approaches. We use rational drug design and that's the computational approach we call selective evolution by identifying those optimal, optimal amino acids which bind to the target involved in protein or protein non protein interactions. And the value, because once again, it's very efficient, very quick, and we can save money by moving the drug discovery process to the left. And in my final slide are my friends, my friends and colleagues. That's me on the left, my ACDC t-shirt. John is my co-founder. I've known him for a long time. Carla and Josh are uh, great scientists who work in the lab, who've done a lot of the work that you see here. And uh, I thank them very uh, profusely for being uh, here and helping me get this work done very efficiently. And that's it, right on time. Great. Minutes. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. I Thank appreciate you. it. Wonderful presentation. We appreciate that. Absolutely. I love the ACDC shirt too, by the way. Yeah, well, our, our theme song for the company is Highway to Hell. So, <laughs> so we, uh, we, uh, we take ACDC seriously. My friend, my friend John, is from Australia and he tells a story of him being a bouncer at a bar in Sydney where one time a group was there and he didn't realize it, it was ACDC. So he, he's <laughs> very good back with them. So we're, we're compatible with that. Uh, with sure Malcolm Young and then we're cutting it up in that bar too. Yeah, and Bob bon Scott. So, that, that's, uh, so that's, and I like, I feel like ACDC pretty much. Okay, so Malcolm thank you so much. Guess, you know, I'm a huge fan. Good, I'm glad to hear this. We're, 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 uh, we're copacetic on that, that's great. <laughs> Wonderful talk. We appreciate that. We've got some good questions from the audience, so we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Okay. The first one is from Aoi Benan from San Diego, okay. and Anoy is asking, when do you expect to begin clinical trials with protein-based therapeutics? That's a good question. Well, the question is, that's really a money question. Uh, I'm ready to move forward with, um, well, I, Skunk Works is ready to move forward with, um, the pre, you know, pre IND enabling studies. Question is, we have to, we're in a process of trying to raise the uh, three to five million dollars to get it done. The goal would be to get it done within uh, eighteen months, because right we have we have a discovery uh, sort of a paradigm that it will allow us to move quickly because we know what our uh, drug discovery, we know what our leads are. It's really a question of raising the appropriate funds. So uh, I have grants in um, that we hope to do. Get, get get funded and we're looking for either VCs or partners to help us move forward. The other thing that's going on is that with the STTR at Wild Medical, it's looking at pediatric neural tumors, specifically in, in the case of the STTR, which is a grant between a company and a uh, academic institution. We're looking at ATRT, which is uh, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, very rare tumor, but there is, it's an unmet medical need there was no treatment for it. And the physicians there have said, if, if any of these work, they will be very happy to move it into what they call phase zero, which is a physician, physician assisted trial. So while Cornell is actually doing studies now with some of our, our constructs, and hopefully we can, we can move on a two front approach where they move forward at their end doing animal studies, we move forward on our end doing some animal studies and then hopefully raise the money. So the goal is to get it within 18 months to two years. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you for that. And uh, Sherlyn Zhu from Houston is asking, could you please explain the major advantages of your new antibody drug conjugates compared to the classic ones like MMAE or DM1 and specifically how do they perform in, in terms of efficacy off-drug target effects, tumor penetration, and other factors? Okay, that's a good question. ADCs um, are great. I mean, I've worked on antibodies for a long time. I mean, they're specific. Uh, they have long high lives and you can hook up, uh, you know, you hook up drugs to them. It's, 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 it's great. The problem too, there's several problems, not problems, but there are several things to take into consideration. They're very expensive to make number one because you have to make them synthetically, number one, number one. Number two, because of the large, long half-lives, 
people have shown, there are papers out there, more recent papers that show that they're off target effects because what the more circulation in the blood causes, um, you know, some off target effects because you have the linker uh, dissociating and the drugs effect targets distal to the tumor site. The third thing is because antibodies are quite mm -hmm. big, they're 160 molecular weight, thousand molecular weight, they have trouble getting to the tumor. And in fact, there was a, an estimate that 0.0006% of antibody drug conjugates actually get into the tumor. Now, these small proteins, on the other hand, have a short half-life. So once again, they're not in the bloodstream very long, but people have shown that you get great tumor accretion because they, uh, you, it gets in very, very quickly. In the case of, for example, the pediatric tumors, the physicians want a shorter half-life because the longer these, these conjugates remain in the brain, the more chances of untoward toxic effects in the kids. Um, also, the fact is someone is, some people have shown you get about three to 6%. So about tenfold, maybe to a thousandfold more accretion within the tumor, even though you have a shorter half-life. So there are risks, benefits, or good things, bad things about both. Antibody drug conjugates are well known. They're, they're defined, they have good half-lives. Small, small proteins have shorter half-lives, but have you know cheaper to make, better tumor accretion because of their size. So there are, there are different things they have to take into consideration. I'm a firm believer in you want to get in, you want to get out. You don't want the thing circulating in the blood. Take MMME, for example, or statin A. If I give that to a patient, I might as well just shoot them because it's totally toxic. So the thing is, you do not want that to break, to unlink from your antibody drug conjugate in the body. You want to get that, that drug in, into the tumor, getting rid of anything that's residual in the blood. So that's, that's our approach. So we have certain benefits that we believe will make it uh, you know, com comparable or maybe better than in certain cases than antibody drug conjugates. Not that I'm putting out antibody drug conjugates because I'm an antibody guy from way back. So I, I have utmost respect for them. But I think we have a better approach that will prove itself in the end. Great. Okay. Great. Thanks. Great answer. Appreciate that. And next is a question from Abir Off from Saudi Arabia. He says, greetings. And okay. Abir asks, you. how, uh, hold on one second. I got to go back up. Let me find that question once again. How is mix, how is mix inhibitor delivered to the target cancer? How, how is the MYC inhibitor delivered to the target cancer cells? And how is this inhibitor not targeting MYC in the normal cells? Uh, good question. Um, so for example, um, in the case of the uh, 429, which is the IGF inhibitor with the, with the, with the uh, MYC inhibitor, with the specific MYC inhibitor, this inhibitor, this, this, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but let's, let's just call it S. This, 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 this protein S or this, this segment S is sort of a tumor, uh, uh, how do you put this? Uh, not a tumor associated antigen. It's a um, uh, blocking, I'm blocking the term, it's like P53, it, blo it basically blocks MYC uh, involvement. There's sort of a yin yang in terms of uh, the overexpression of this, this mimic will actually downregulate MYC. So in let's say an ATRT, which is that pediatric tumor I'm talking about, this protein is actually missing, and that's why MYC is involved in it. So by delivering it directly to a, a, a tumor cell, uh, we can we can actually block MYC without just by upregulating this uh, tumor inhibitory protein. In the case of the dimer, and remember, 429 will, will will internalize. So we drag into the cell. We have a nuclear localization signal, which we've shown goes directly into the nucleus, so we can actually block MYC within the nucleus. In the case of the 2626 dimer, which is a mic mic homo dimer, this protein by itself will internalize. So it actually goes in by itself and it blocks mic. So when the question is, we've looked at normal cells and we do not see an effect on normal cells. It only seems to block uh, overexpression of mic or mic uh, inducing proliferation in tumor cells. What happens in, let's say, in animals with patients, we'll have to wait until we do the animal studies. And if it, obviously, if the animal studies don't work, we're not going to proceed. But if we can show inhibition in animal studies, then the question becomes, you know, safety in humans. And once again, I, that's hard to predict because uh, you never know what happens. You can, it's hard to predict from animals to humans. But our, but our thought is that we're not going to affect normal, normal MYC 
in this instance. But I can't address that until we actually do the studies. But once again, we believe that, at least in the case of the 429 IGF inhibitor, a uh, MIC inhibitor, which is not, uh, which, which is sort of a, a yin to the mix yang, we think it will not affect the normal cells because it already has that protein already in there. So all we're doing is adding extra of it. So once again, we can't tell until the animal studies which are being done right now, okay? Great, thank you for that. Great answer. And uh, we'll have, we have time for one more question. This one will be from a Vicki Goldenstein from Duke University. Vicki okay. says hello and she likes your logo and the name of your company. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we all okay. Do. And That's Vicky good. is asking, do you perform a complete saturated mutagenesis on all the amino acids in your screens? And if yes, are you interested in implementing an in vitro protein display to increase the initial peptide screening throughput? So this may be more of like a collaborative question. The answer is I'm always willing to collaborate, number one. So I'll take the se second part afterwards. Uh, you, you probably have my email someplace. Um, in terms of the, uh, the approach, um, what we did in the old days, actually, the old days, was to actually, let's say, keep the motif constant and then make secondary libraries in which we, we did what we call doping. That is, we changed, allowed each position around the motif to change to any of the other 19 amino acids. So for the, the case of the insulin mimetic, we didn't use, we used a computational approach, but prior to that, we used a secondary library approach. Now we just use the computational approach because what we can find, what we find is that the, the binding uh, to, by the docking to the target actually shows us the amino acids. I didn't show you this. I have, I have, I can speak for seven hours, which you don't want me to do. I, you know, I'll, put, I'll put you all asleep, but we can actually, it actually shows you the appropriate amino acids or those optimal amino acids that bind and will give you a list of other amino acids, which, which might be better. And in that case, because we're only talking about small proteins, they're easy to make. So we can easily make uh, these small proteins very, very quickly. So once again, it's, it's a combination of both um, lab work, wet work, a, I won't call it AI, but bioinformatics that allow us and recombinant and, and recombinant molecular biology that sort of is, is, is integrated into this uh, holistic approach for drug discovery. So mm -hmm. once again, yes, and if people want to collaborate, you have my email address, contact me and I'd love to talk to you. Okay. Is your uh, email in that contact QR code there, I guess? or It's in the QR code. I don't know whether you're sending this out. It's going to be on our website. Yeah. I don't know how this Well, I can actually see your, your email, too, and on the side here underneath your name. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just oh, cool. ngolcine at skwxbio.com. Vicky, if, if, Vicky, if you're interested in the collaboration with Dr. Goldstein, please please go ahead uh, and reach reach out to him directly. Yeah, just, email. Just, just, yeah just reach out to me. I'm, I'm always happy to uh, to uh, respond, okay? Yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up with that. So first of all, I'd like to thank all the attendees. We had a good turnout today from a variety of different places, primarily the U.S., but we had Saudi Arabia and a few other places as well. Dr. Golds, Dr. Goldstein, I'd really like to thank you as well for um, all your efforts at this presentation today. And I want to congratulate you and your team for all your success and hard work. It's just fantastic and very exciting. And we uh, look forward to seeing therapeutics actually approved and in the clinic from your work. Well, listen, I really appreciate the, the ability, the time to give the talk. And I thank you very much. And thanks to all the people who uh, decided to join. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we had a good audience. And then finally, I would like to thank my uh, colleague and good friend, Priscilla Hernandez at Sinobiological. She was the moderator and really the host and uh, made sure that all the technical capabilities um, flowed with, without a hitch. And so thank you, Priscilla, for all your efforts as well. And with that, I'll say good afternoon or good evening to everybody. And we hope to see you again on our, on our next scheduled lock and key immunodetection webinar. So thank all you. Right. Thank you, Rob. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.